All right. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining. I really appreciate it. This training is for uh, grantees of the Emergency Rental Assistance Community Grant Program. Uh, we're going to start by just giving a quick overview of the and then you will see some. Um, if everyone could please just make sure that they're muted while we go through the presentation, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. So just a quick overview of the emergency rental assistance program. This nationwide appropriated about $25 billion for emergency rental assistance. Of that, Salt Lake County received $29 million. Um, the state of Utah received $215 million. But so the grant that you guys are being paid with is from the $29 million in emergency rental assistance funds that uh, Salt Lake County received. Um, the uses for these funds are obviously direct assistance for rent and rental arrears for a maximum of 12 months. Uh, that's also good for utility and utility arrears. It's also good for other expenses related to housing, which includes internet, uh, which, is, which is really wonderful, especially uh, in the world that we live in now. And then kind of the last piece is that up to 10% of the funding can be used for administrative costs. Um, so what that means, that actually doesn't apply to you all as grantees. That applies to Salt Lake County. So the grant funds that you're being paid with are part of the 10% administrative costs that Salt Lake County uh, has to, to administer these, these emergency rental assistance funds. Because you guys are helping out with the application assistance, that's the part where the 10% is, is the grant funding that you guys are, are, um, are being allocated. As far as eligibility, at least one person in the household has to be either unemployed or experience a reduction in income due to COVID-19, uh, a risk of homelessness or housing instability, and has to have a household income at or below 80% of the area median income. Now, just so you guys know, those things are established in the application. So you don't have to worry about asking an applicant those questions before you begin the application. Within the application is an eligibility screening. So before we sort of dive into the portal, I just want to walk through what the required documents are. So there's, the, there, there's a few things that you have to upload with an application in order for it to be submitted correctly. So that would be a tenant income verification. That would be the lease agreement, all pages of that the landlord's W-9, any past due rental documentation, so an itemized ledger, or past due utility notice, or a utility shutoff notice, if that's applicable, and then an eviction notice, if that's applicable. So obviously, if you're working with an applicant who is not being evicted, then they wouldn't have an eviction notice, so that, that isn't required. But if there is an eviction notice, that's something that you want to make sure is uploaded. So... Income verification can be, can be a couple of things. It will be a tax form or a W-2, a 1099, um, you know, any of those tax, form, tax forms that would indicate income, a recent pay stub. So you'd want to, if it's pay stubs, you'd want to indicate 30 days uh, of recent pay. Also, bank statements that can demonstrate a regular income, those can count as income verification or unemployment unemployment insurance so weekly payment history if that's if that's applicable so those are those are the best income verifications now as we go through the application you'll notice that you're not that, that, that you're not required to upload a document in order to move on to the next phase but the entire goal of this grant program is to have you guys help these applicants upload these documents because the more the better the up uh, the better the documents that are uploaded so like the more complete lease a, do, a landlord w9 that income verification the smoother the process goes once the application has been submitted so the preference is always to have a document uploaded as opposed to uh and, and i'll show you this option but it's sort of a box where you can explain why you don't have access uh or why you can't upload that document but it's important to note that when you when you put you know when you when you try and demonstrate the reason you don't have a document, it will slow down the process of that application and getting it getting it submitted. So the lease agreement, this is pretty uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. All pages of the lease. So I understand sometimes leases are hard to come by, and and what I would tell all of you is that it's okay for you to reach out to the landlord um, on behalf of the person that you're helping if they're comfortable with that. 
Um, Utah Community Action is doing that on the back end. They're reaching out to landlords. But if that's an additional step that you guys can take to help that application get through the process more smoothly, then I would absolutely encourage you to do that. Landlord W9. Now, this is something that is, you know, sometimes a little bit like a landlord might be like, why are you asking me for this for this document? Um, you just want to say that you are you are helping a, you are helping this person's tenant get rental assistance. Um, and, and so it's OK for you to for you to contact that landlord. And like I just said, you know, if you guys don't do it, then, you know, certainly Utah Community Action will do it on the back end. But this is just another way that we can help ensure these applications are getting through uh, as quickly as possible. So the past due rent docs, so an itemized ledger that shows the outstanding rent and other fees. This is really important because, as we saw earlier, these funds can be spent or eligible for 12 months of rent. So that itemized ledger showing what is owed is really key uh, to making sure that that we're that we're able to pay, you know, what it what is owed. And then obviously a past due utility notice, um, you know, those bills that show these utilities are in arrears. That's that's going to be necessary to make sure we can make these payments. And then, like I said before, that eviction notice. Um, if there is an eviction notice, you'll want to make sure that that gets uploaded. All right, so let's kind of dive into the portal. So I've I've taken a series of screenshots here, um, and so I'm going to walk through those because one, I'm going to send this presentation to you all, uh, so that as you're talking to people or you're you know if you if part of what your program is 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 facilitating a town hall or something that you could just use these same screen grabs. Um, so I'll send this out to you so that you all have you all have access to it. Um, but I'm not actually going to walk through the slides because I'm finding that to be annoying right this minute. All right, so this is the homepage of rentrelief.utah.gov. As you can see, it's pretty, you know, it's bright and yellow and bold. And right down here is the apply button. So that's really where your, where your application is going to start. But I do want to say that right here below the application button is the eligible uses of funds. To, to, so that information is there for you if you need to access it again. Um, a full list and some examples of that documentation that's required for the application. Uh, so that's, that's listed there. And then some frequently asked questions. Uh, these, these are super helpful. These are taken from the guidance uh, from the Treasury and also the policies and procedures that the state provides. Um, so there's just a little bit of helpful information here below the apply button. But let's go ahead and dive right in. So the first screen that you're going to come to is whether it is I am a renter or I am a landlord. Uh, I, it, it would be my assumption that most of you would be helping applicants who are applying as renters. Um, so that's how we're going to that's how we're going to walk through this together. So let's go with I am a renter. So right here again, it's going to remind us and tell us what the documents that are required for the application are. Um, it'll help us just, you know, kind of keep a running list so that we know tenant in income verification, lease agreement, landlord W-9, past due rent documentation from the landlord, and then past due utility notice or eviction notice if that's applicable. So the next step is to create a Utah ID. Um, this is something that you have to do. There's unfortunately no way around it uh, if you're helping an applicant. One thing I would say is that you would, you'll want to help your applicant set up their own Utah ID. And I say that because there have been some problems in the system where an intake screener or I'm just going to say maybe somebody like Ellie, for example, might have been trying to help multiple people with applications using their own Utah ID. And it's causing glitches in the system and it's making it hard for those applications. So I would encourage you to have an applicant create their own Utah ID, which you can just do right here. It's pretty easy. It's exactly the same process that you would go through uh, if you were applying for unemployment insurance, insurance or something like that. So I already have a Utah ID, I think. Let's see if that's. The right password. I feel like I win. Um, 
so I've already done this. This this will not come up for you. <laughs> I've already uh, gone in and created an application. So uh, so this will this will not happen for you. So we're going to start a new application. So the first the first page here is an eligibility screening. So those eligibility requir requirements that we talked about at the very beginning. This is where it's going to show. Uh, this this is that screening. So you don't have to worry about any of that. So monthly gross income. So what are you what are you making a month? Let's just say that. What is my annual gross income? What is my household size? Your street address. Okay. So all that's pretty self-explanatory, putting in your address, the number of people that are in your household and your monthly and annual gross income. Now, if somebody doesn't know that, that's something you can help them pull off of the, the income verification, right? So so that's, that's how we're coming to that. You don't wanna just guess as I did because I'm just giving you an example. So moving down here, this is where, these are the questions that help determine uh, whether or not an applicant has been uh, has experienced a reduction in income or unemployment because of COVID-19. So has one or more individuals within the household qualified for unemployment benefits or experienced a reduction in household income, incurred significant costs, or experienced other financial hardship directly or indirectly with COVID-19 after March 12, 2020? Yes. You want the answer to be yes. Choose all that apply. So maybe they've uh, qualified for unemployment benefits and maybe incurred significant costs and experienced other financial hardships. You can select all that apply. So it could be all four, it could be one. Second question is, can one or more individuals within the household demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability, which may include a past due utility or rent notice or eviction notice, unsafe or unhealthy living conditions, or any other evidence of such risk as determined by the eligible grantee. Yes. If someone has a uh, past due rent, past due rent and utilities, and pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And then are you receiving assistance from another organization that is paying your rent in full? Now this doesn't exclude someone from being eligible um, but it's, but in this case, you know, as this applicant, I'm going to say that I am not receiving any other assistance. But if someone you're working with is receiving assistance, make sure that you answer that, uh, truthfully. Okay. So then everything is, is run against the USPS, uh, to make sure that addresses are cleansed. So clearly I typed in the wrong, uh, zip code here. It's going to correct it for me. So I'm just going to hit okay. Okay, so here we are again, a reminder of the documents and you don't actually have to check these, but as you're sitting with an applicant filling out an application, you may want to, you may want to say like, okay, here's our, here's our tenant income verification. Okay. We've got all the pages of our lease. Okay. Here's our W9 past due rent documentation. We don't need an eviction notice. Um, and we have past due utilities. So then we're just going to click start application. All right, so uh, some of this is auto-filled uh, because I have a Utah ID, so that's totally normal. Once you create that Utah ID, things like the name, name might auto-populate. Let's hold all the questions until the end, if that's okay. Yeah, that's um, perfect, that's what I was gonna ask, thank you. Okay, uh, so then our phone number, right? Pretty, pretty easy. I'm gonna put my age. Self-selecting race, self-selecting gender, self-selecting ethnicity, all pretty easy stuff. All right, and you can see here, it's pulled my monthly gross and my annual gross from my eligibility screening here at the top, okay? So the first question, are you or anyone in your household currently unemployed and have been unemployed for more than 90 days? So someone might be currently unemployed, but you only want, this is, this is for 90 days. So let's say I haven't been unemployed for 90 days. So you need to provide verification for both your monthly and annual gross income. 
right? So it's the most helpful if someone can provide you with their W-2 and their pay stubs. That is, that is the ultimate most helpful thing that you want to have someone provide for you. So then there's just an upload box. I'm going to go upload file. Now, how you guys organize all of these files on your computers or, on, or, or how you help an applicant, we understand that the technology barrier is something, you know, that a lot of, a lot of applicants might come up against. And so hopefully, and I'm sure many of you are already doing this in plan too, but likely you'll be filling these out on the computer with somebody. Um, so kind of another piece of that is how you're able to get an uploadable copy of a W-9 or a, uh, or a W-2 or a 1099 or a, a landlord's W-9. So photos of those, like if you're sitting next to somebody and you can take a picture of all of those pages, that's totally good. If you have a scanner, obviously that's optimal. Um, but those, that's something that, you know, is really going to be necessary and helpful for these applicants. If you can also help them with the scanning of the documents so that they can become, uh, electronic documents. Lauren, I have a question. If we can hold all the questions to the end, that would be the most helpful. I'll have, we'll have plenty of Thank time you. for questions. I promise. Thanks. All right. So I've got my, uh, upload put in here. Check this box. Okay. So this right here is the box. If you're unable to provide any of this documentation, you check this box and this uh, kind of text box pops up. And this is where you're gonna wanna put an, an explanation of why you're unable to obtain documentation of income. Um, and like I said a little bit ago, this is, uh, you know, you wanna make sure if you're helping an applicant that this is a reasonable reason as to why they don't have that documentation. Um, but I, but I want to just stress that whatever we can do to help an applicant gather these documents, we want to do because filling out this text box, while it's totally fine, it's just going to slow the, slow the process down. So I'm going to uncheck that because I have my income verification. I'm going to hit continue. All right. Are you receiving rent assistance from another organization? No. Are you receiving utility use assistance from another organization? No. All right. So then we're going to, it's going to ask about the lease situation. Uh, many people are on a month to month lease. Uh, All about people... it. They have received heat in the last 12 months. Okay. Sorry. I, I promise we'll talk about all the questions. If you oh. could just please hold all of the questions until the end. Okay. Um, so this is where you would select, you know, if somebody has a three month lease or if somebody has a month to month lease, we're going to go with the termed lease. We're going to put the date of that lease ending as June 30th, 2021. If paid on time, what is the total amount of rent due to your landlord, uh, including concessions, fees, amenities, utilities, et cetera. Okay, there's $5,000 that I owe, my current rent due for this month, and all of this you'll be able to help somebody find on their lease. When is your rent payment due in order to avoid additional fees? So you would put that, you would put that date in and maybe that's, um, or you can just click on the calendar, which is super helpful. Um, so a situation like this uh, is a little bit precarious because right now the turnaround between application and payment is about 14 days. Um, the, there's these, you know, these situations, uh, but for purposes of this training, we're going to say that it's May 31st. Uh, actually, no, we're going to say that it's May 15th. I'm so sorry. If you're seeking assistance for a security deposit, so if somebody, you know, uh, security deposits can be covered by this. Um, do you owe rent for previous months? Yes. How many months are you behind in rent? Let's see, I'm three months behind in rent, including all fees. Okay. So down here is where you're going to upload the lease agreement and the ledger. Okay, um, so you'll want to they'll you'll want to have two upload files here. Okay, so you should have two uploads uh, in this section. Um, 
But then right here, under limited circumstances, check this box if you are unable to provide any documentation of your rental agreement and or proof of payments. So again, checking this box, this is going to allow the applicant and you to explain, give a reasonable reason as to why these documents can't be provided. Now, I will say just again, that once an application goes into Utah Community Action and an intake screener is looking at it, they're going to reach out to the landlord to get that W-9 and potentially the lease agreement. But again, it's the most helpful if we could help these applications be as complete as possible before they're submitted. Okay, if you pay utilities separate from your rent, do you need financial assistance to pay them? Very likely. Um, so this is where you'd want to list the utility providers. So let's say that I need help paying my power bill. my uh, gas and my uh, and my internet. So because I've put three bills here, I'm gonna wanna put three bills down here in the upload, if that makes sense. So we're gonna go upload. It will allow you to upload multiple documents which is really helpful since they're asking for multiple documents. So I've got three documents. I've got three utility providers. That's just another way that this is going to go smoothly. And we're going to hit continue. All right, this is the, uh, this is the landlord W9 section. So I'm going to put my landlord's legal name as Obviously, Mike Gallegos is not my landlord. He is my boss, just for the record, in case anyone's wondering. I'm going to put his phone number. Okay. And this is the landlord mailing address. So this is a good time to mention that all of these payments are going directly to landlords and directly to utility providers. So uh, it's important that the landlord mailing address, it, it doesn't necessarily need to match the address that you're applying for rental assistance for. You want to make sure that it goes to the landlord's, uh, the landlord's mailing address. Now, you might be thinking, why is, you know, why, why would it allow me to select a state? This is Utah, because there are some, obviously, landlords that are you know, out of the owning property in Utah and not living in the state of Utah. Okay. And then this is the landlord business address. Um, this is optional. This should be, you know, as shown on the W-9, but this isn't different. Okay, and then are you related to the landlord? There's a lot of familial rental situations. Um, I am not related to my landlord, let's just say, but if I am, there's no extra boxes. It's just additional information. And this is where you're going to want to upload the landlord's W-9. And it's and it's common, uh, you know, for, for a lot of applications to not have this W-9. In this case, if you click, I'm unable to provide my landlord's W-9, there's no need to, to create that explanation as in the other screens before. Um, so we're going to click continue. Again, it's going to go through that address cleanse to make sure that I have entered the correct information. So we're going to allow that to happen on both of these addresses that I entered. Okay, and this is it. This is the last page. So this is all the steps that have been completed. You can go and edit your information. If there's more that you wanna add, you can click on each one of these links and it will take you back to that exact page. You're gonna to wanna to certify under criminal penalty that you're telling the truth, that all these information is true and correct. Um, and there also there's a quality control process. So each application goes through a quality control process on the back end, and you'll wanna, this is where you'll, you know, you'll click to say you understand that and you'll hit submit application. I'm not going to submit this application, but if I did hit submit application, a very important window would pop up right here in the center of my screen. 
And it would say something like success, you know, celebration, you've submitted your application and it's going to give you a number that's called the application ID. This number is very important to both you and the applicant that you're helping. Both of you are going to want to write this down. Um, for you grantees, this is something that you're going to be reporting back to the county. So when we get to the piece about reporting our outreach efforts, um, each of you will upload a list every week listing the application IDs that you or your organization helped to submit that week. Um, and then this is also important if, uh, you know, if an applicant wants to go back in and check the status, that application ID is, uh, is key to be able to find the, the correct application. So that is the, that is the portal. I mean, if you have all of those documents, it's, it's relatively, it's relatively simple. Um, so our final, our final check and submit. So I'm gonna, let's see. Let me go back here. All right, I'm happy to take a couple of questions, but I want to be able to see you all. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, happy to take a couple of questions. Um, let's go with Kathleen first. She's got her hand up. Um, so I have two questions. Um, what if the applicant's rent is normally paid online via an automatic withdrawal so they don't actually have an address and or the landlord won't accept a check it needs to be a cashier's check or um, an online payment so for withdrawal. so for that question i would have to get back to you um there there is no option with emergency rental assistance to have these funds paid electronically um, I, I wouldn't imagine that in this case, if someone was in rental arrears, that a landlord wouldn't accept a check from the state of Utah, but I would have to get back to you to back to you on that. A mailing address, however, should be able to be found on a W9, um, that the, that, you know, on that landlord W9. So, but I would have to get back to you on the electronic payment. Okay. My other quick question is on that last page where you're certifying under penalty of law, et cetera, et cetera, is that me certifying or the applicant certifying that is the applicant certifying so all of these applications that you're helping with these are all about the applicant you guys are just all acting as the assistant uh, to make sure that these are filled out as completely as possible other questions i have one lauren yeah so what if the client happens to live in a hostel and they don't actually have a lease um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe hostels could be considered the same as, well, maybe not. Actually, that's a question I would have to, I would also have to get back to you on. There are so many kind of specific situations. Um, I know on the application that I did do, um, it, I put in there in the thing that she, her landlord was helping her with all of that. That's actually who brought her here to us. And it, I just put in there that she lived at a hostel, but she didn't have a lease. And all I know is cap sent. I messed up and did it through my Utah ID, obviously. So it did come back to me as she needed to turn in a lease and I called her landlord and everything. And I don't. They don't do leases, so I'm just not sure. Um, I mean, that would probably be, I mean, if like in the application, you know, like, like I said, if you don't have a lease, um, you're not required to put one, you're not required to upload one in order to continue on in the application. So I would say that in that, I would check that box where a lease isn't available. And then I would explain that. And that's something okay. that, uh, the cap, the case manager from the cap will follow up with the tenant about and also probably with the landlord. So it's not going to stop you from submitting the application. There just might have to be some additional explanations along the way. Okay. Sorry, I'm taking some notes. Let me just and they, we this. don't have to upload an ID for them either, correct? Nope, you don't need to upload an ID. Um, it does not, it does not ask for a copy of a, of an ID card of any kind. Um, this recording will be available, uh, as probably tomorrow morning. Sometimes, you know, it takes some time. Um, and I'll send the link out to the recording for everyone. And then, uh, Tanya asked if, uh, the lease has to be current. 
what if the lease is expired? Uh, if the lease is expired, um, well, that's a that's a great question. Um, now that I know Mike Gallegos is on here, Mike, do you know the answer to that question? You shouldn't have identified yourself. <laughs> repeat the question. Um, what if the lease is expired? Uh, then you'd have to get it renewed. Okay. That's simple. Has to be correct. Uh, so which means, to... which, which brings up another question, and that would be um, if they're still renting, they're probably on a month to month, which will change the process going forward if they don't have an, an, a lease that's longer term. Correct. And I am going to allow Sahil when he hops on in about uh, 10 minutes to answer the question that you probably all just popped in your heads about, well, what is the process if it's a month to month lease? So I promise I will have Sahil address that first. Thank you, Mike, for your help on that. I appreciate it. Other questions? I know there was a couple during. I apologize for interrupting the asking of the questions. Maybe in the Met had a question. I, I want to ask. I it sometimes it happened that you lost your job um, two months ago, but now you are working, but you own some you know money to pay back because they did pay, and they know some bank they have been they gave some relief you know time for people to pay the rent and uh, some people they took six months without paying especially the landlord is this a program can support that to pay to back debt the payment or it's just uh, something you needed to uh you know not to be working that time or it can be like a few months ago so that's a great question it can be used for things for for any arrears so you know, just like your example, if, you know, if somebody was unemployed 2 months ago and they missed their rent and now, you know, now they now they are employed and they're able to pay it. These funds are eligible to cover, you know, those just example of 2 months of rent that they missed for that unemployment. As long as, um, as long as 1 person uh, in the household met those eligibility requirements. So, being unemployed um, or having a significant sort of financial loss due to COVID that would the, um, they would absolutely be eligible. So we we'll have to upload that a uh, letter because many people they were given a letter to that the job is no longer available and uh, we have to upload those data from the you know from the company and then we can submit the application. Yeah, so you'll want to show the verification of that time of unemployment. So you know a bank statement that would show a lack of regular income or um, you know. Anything that would sort of demonstrate that what you're saying is 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 true, just so that when a case manager goes back to look at it, they can say, "Oh, yes, here's you know, here's the the bank statement and the income verification that backs up this, uh, backs up this idea." Okay. Hi, Lauren. This is Andy with Asian. Hey, Andy. Hey. Um. Quick question. So I have two questions. One is, will this pay for mortgage assistance? Unfortunately, not. Uh, these funds are only for rental assistance. Um, I know that eventually, uh, with the American Recovery Act plan funds, that mortgage assistance will be available. Um, but that will be a separate program when it's when it's rolled out. So right now, right now, we're only talking about rental assistance and utility assistance. No mortgage okay. assistance. Okay. Thank you for clarification. And secondly. Thank you. Um, I was thinking that the, the also it will cover the mortgage. Uh, is not okay. Thank you, Andy, for asking. Lauren, my second question is for those individuals who are undocumented and things like that. What's the best way for self? Is it a self declaration that they were working at? You know, this place, that place. Yeah, um, so a self declaration. You know, as to wherever you were working, and um, if you have. I mean, anything that would verify income, there's nothing on the application as you saw that asks about uh, asks for documentation or immigration status or anything like that. So, um, anything that will demonstrate that uh, that income will be will be helpful in the in the back on the back end of the process. 
Hi, Lauren. This is Mehmet from Emerald Hills Institute. Uh, hey, Mehmet. So, hey, uh, this uh, webinar and also presentation would be available uh, because I would like to have this webinar to be watched by my team as well. So, any idea? Yes, so this is being recorded um, right now and it should be available online sometime tomorrow. And I will share the link to the video with all of you once it is live online. Yeah, and also um, some flyers and documentations to help me and my team to disseminate this threat assistance, right? Yes, so that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. So we are, um, we are working with the state uh, very closely on the, the, document, the documents, sort of the flyers and the advertising for the program. We want to make sure that it's very clear that there is one single portal where Utahns can go to apply for rental assistance. So we're working with the state on the development of a flyer. Um, there's some social media assets that, that we already have access to, which of course will make all of this available to you guys. Um, what I would say probably in the next five days, uh, I'll provide you with a link to a Google Drive folder that will have uh, some social media assets. It'll have a version of a flyer um, that you can all print out. Um, also on anything that you distribute, we'll wanna have uh, the Salt Lake County Housing and Community Development logo added to it. Um, since those are the funds that are paying for the dissemination of the, the information. So we'll wanna make sure that those are on there as well, but we'll absolutely be providing you with some, some Printable collateral assets that you can that you can utilize. Uh, Lauren, yes. Um, let me interject here because uh, Andy Tran asked about mortgage assistance, and I saw where uh, someone from CDC Utah uh, popped up the, an item on the chat. There is mortgage assistance through the American Rescue Plan. However, uh, the state just applied for it. There was a, a deadline for states to apply uh, to the Treasury Department for the funding for mortgage assistance. That deadline was on Sunday, and it's gonna be a state-only delivered program. <clears throat> funding will not go beyond the state of Utah, uh, down to the counties or cities. Uh, so the state will be delivering that program through a separate process, so that's yet to be determined. So. Uh, Look forward to that information. We'll try to share the information as we get it as well. But thank you. Yeah, thanks for that flag, Mike. I appreciate you you adding that. More questions? A uh, question. This is Viral here. I have one question. Um, how far are we in this process? And, and like, till how long will it last to provide assistance on rental? Certainly. So. Uh, right now, this program goes through, um, gosh, I feel like maybe it just changed. I feel like it's June of 2022 um, is how long these funds will be available. Right now, we're still working the term of the agreement with the grant as through uh, January 31st of 2022. Um, obviously, that term may change kind of as guidance uh, is updated from the Treasury about how um, the additional emergency rental assistance funds that are coming through the American Recovery Plan Act, you know, how, how that all is going to work together. Um, so, but these, these funds uh, can go all the way through June of 2022. That still means, though, that um, for a single applicant, only 12 months um, in, in very uh, specific situations, it could go up to 15 months of rental assistance. But most will be uh, most are only eligible for 12 months of rental assistance. Lauren, yes, the flyer you mentioned earlier, will that be translated into multiple languages? Um, I believe it will only be provided in English and Spanish. That's the that that's sort of the the stickler. And so um, we would love to work with you and your organizations. And I know we have some. Um, we have some, uh, some, some folks at the county who, who can help with translations, uh, but we'll definitely be relying on you guys a lot to help with the language barriers that are going to be, um, that we're going to be coming up against in the process. We'll have, when we have access to those um, documents, we can help with that process. 
great. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. A question: uh, The people uh, you know who are impacted, but they borrowed money to pay rent. Will they be qualified for this? And you know, how would they get? Like, you know, they haven't paid rent because they already paid rent, but they just borrowed money to pay rent. How would that qualify? Uh, that's a that is a great question that I do not have the answer to. Um, that's something that we can ask Sahil. So, so instead of um, paying to a landlord, they would be repaying a loan to a bank. Yeah. Is that um, I, I am not, I'm not totally sure about that. Mike, if you have any, uh, on that, if you have any ideas on that, but I think that's a great question to ask Sahil when he pops on as well. Um, I don't have a specific response to that other than, uh, I know there were people that, uh, paid rent using their credit card. And, um, if you, if that documentation is available, I could see that, uh, possibly being accepted, but, um. We'll have to, um, again, uh, as Lauren mentioned, maybe Sahil could answer that as I'm sure they've gone through that, uh, those issues previously. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Other, other question we have is that, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. I apologize for interrupting you. No, no worries. Other question I have is about the, you know, if you're renting from the, you know, bigger community, the like apartment, they may have a better process and done providing documentation. But sometimes a lot of people rent from like independent landlord, right? They may not be supportive to a lot of documentation because it takes time to generate or they don't have one. As an example, ledger, right? We didn't provide. What happens in that situation where tenant is impacted, but they are unable to get a lot of documentation support from landlord, uh, you know, to prove that they're impacted? So that's a great question. And that's, and that is something that's kind of important to note is that it does, you know, it, it's the most helpful if a landlord and a tenant, uh, you know, can in some ways work together to get this assistance. Um, I, you know, I would say in a situation like that, maybe where a lease doesn't exist or a ledger doesn't exist, you know, certainly Utah Community Action is doing everything they can to collect as much information as they can to get a, an application from just, you know, submitted to approved and paid. Um, so, you know, I think every situation is is a little bit different, um, but I, you know, I, I know that that on the back end, uh, you know, everyone is working as hard as possible, you know, through all the kind of tough situations to to get rental assistance where it's needed. So I would say, you know, kind of in specific situations like that, you know, that's a place where perhaps, you know, you as a as an organization could step in and help to maybe, you know, work with a landlord or an applicant to create that ledger. Um, that can be uploaded to show or, or, you know, that's obviously something that um, that Utah Community Action is doing as well. Um, this is also an important place to, to know that. Um, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. That's really, it's really annoying. Um, but that, you know, Utah Community Action is, is certainly contacting landlords and, and trying to fill in holes. But again, this is a, a really helpful place if you guys are able to step in and step in and do that and work with the work with the landlord as well. Um, just just like I said, to to get the to get the process. Um, does that and that doesn't totally answer well, yeah, the question, that, but hopefully it helps. definitely helps. It just we have flexibility right? in terms of working with landlord to see what they can generate. It can be the simple Excel document showing the dates and what they paid and what they not made, right? That can be the simple, you know, document can be generated as a as a ledger, as a proof. Right. Really helpful. And my last question that I'll stop is about a document that we are you know, collecting from the tenant or, or the person who's impacted and submitting to the you know county site. As a you know, supporter, do we have to keep hold of those documents as a history, or once they're uploaded, we can get rid of those? Um, you don't need to keep them as a history. I mean, that's a uh, you know, I, I would say that that's probably like a lot of personal information that you all don't want yeah. sort of hosting on your personal servers. Um, yeah. So no, you don't need to keep that as a history. It's actually um, it's saved in the person's application, um, and and sort of on that same vein, I mean. If Utah Community Action has a question about an application, the system, the back end of the system is built so that they can send emails to an applicant um, to say like, hey, we need additional information here or, you know, something like that. And, and it's, it's very important, and this is a place where you guys can be helpful as well, is let these tenants or let these applicants know that they may receive further communication from Utah Community Action or the state asking for further information. One way that applications are getting sort of lost and ending up being denied is that uh, 
you know, a case manager or an intake screener is requesting additional information and then they never hear back from a tenant or an applicant. And that application yeah. then just sits stagnant and, and eventually is denied to sort of keep the, you know, to, to keep the pipelines um, as, yeah. as clear and moving. So it's really important to, to make sure, you know, let your applicant know that they may, they need to provide more information um, and to look for those emails. And the other thing that Utah Community Action is really running up against is uh, when they're calling an applicant and asking for additional information, that applicant is not ever answering the phone. Now, there, you know, there could be a couple of things going on. You know, maybe there's a lot of different circumstances, but but it's really, you know, if you guys can sort of help an applicant along the way, you know, make sure they're, you know, returning, checking their messages and returning their messages. And even after they've submitted, um, you know, checking in with them to see if they've, you know, if they've received any information or if there's any follow-up questions, uh, you know, that the state or Utah Community Action has had to ensure that these applications are moving forward. You know, we're seeing that, you know, less than, uh, less than half of the, actually, I think less than more than that, um, maybe 60 to 70 percent of applications that are being submitted have incomplete documents. Okay. Wonderful. Somebody's asked the same question I was going to ask is, what is the turnaround on time once applicants submitted that they should expect a call back about the update, whether they are approved or denied or need more information? Um, so right now it's about two weeks um, is kind of the timeline that it's taking, but it, you know, it really just depends on how kind of the, how the, um, you know, how the pipeline is looking. I'm yeah. sorry, Sahil is trying to get in just want to make sure he has the calendar invite lauren yes i do know with the one application that i had back to me um from cap they gave her a week to get all of that stuff in or it was automatically deleted yes that is that is happening okay that is happening and that is again you know just a way to make sure that the um, that the pipeline, you know, the applications are being assigned, um, that applications are being assigned and that they're, you know, that they're working through them. And while we wait for the hill to hop on, I just kind of want to give you guys a little idea of how the, how the back end works. Um, Lauren, a quick yeah. question. Um, so we've done a couple of surveys with a good four or 500 people and a lot of them don't have emails. How is it that we can help them if they don't have an email? Um, so if they don't have an email, I, I mean, if we help them connect with one. Yeah, I mean, I would say you can help them create an email address. That's, you know, that would be a super easy and helpful thing for you to do. Um, you know, obviously, if they only have a phone number, uh, you know, that, you know, that that's, you know, that that is what it is. Um, but I think probably helping them to connect an email address would probably be the most the most helpful for this situation, um, especially because you know once you create a Utah ID with somebody, that's also going to be the way that they would log into the Department of Workforce Services for anything. So whether that's unemployment insurance, whether that is uh, food assistance, so having that email address could be helpful for uh, you know a couple of different a couple of different reasons. Um, so this, this is a really rudimentary chart to show how the complications of the back end of the system. And if, let's see, I wish I could see if Sahil was here. Um, so, but so when a tenant fills out an application, right, a tenant or a landlord in need of assistance, they go through the portal, right? And so this is, this is the most, this is where you guys are spending most of your time. It's helping this tenant to fill out an application. Once that application is submitted, it's going to an intake worker or an intake screener at Utah Community Action that works to gather any missing information. Those intake workers are the ones who are uh, moving these on to case managers, and a case manager is reaching out to a landlord to get a W-9, and they're scheduling a one-on-one -on -one appointment to actually have a conversation with every single tenant. So there's a lot of work that takes place right there, right? So maybe an intake screener and a case manager is making, you know, five to 10 phone calls before they're able to actually set up a one-on-one -on -one with that tenant to sort of verify the information that's in the application. Once that one-on-one -on -one has happened, that case manager can move the application to 
uh, a, you know, move, move that to approved. That's when it goes through the quality control measures at the state and finalizing the payment amount to make sure that all of the information is backed up and verified with documents. And then that application is submitted for payment and the state is the one who is remitting those payments to landlords and utilities. And the place where you guys, the messiest place for this is between where the application gets filled out and where the cap starts providing the actual case management. The more, the more complete applications and the more support that you guys can provide to an applicant, the faster the rest of this process is going to go. Um, I feel really bad that Sahil is not here yet. Clearly, Lauren. Some... Yes, go ahead. Just, just out of curiosity. So. Andy again with AAU. Yes. Um, so looking at the, that, that chart you just showed where it said that case manager of CAP will be calling our clients for a one-on-one, -on -one. how does that work for individuals who speak multiple languages or don't speak English? I'm assuming CAP is coordinating that with these agencies. And uh, the other question I have is how, um, I just see our community just being very hesitant, being on the phone, especially those who are undocumented, being on the phone and giving some information. You know, you know what I mean? I'm just, this is what I'm here, like being res responsive to the community that the, we work with individually. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I totally understand the hesitancy with that. It, it, you know, it makes perfect sense. There's so much distrust, especially when you're, you know, talking about, um, you know, someone who has a people with different immigration statuses. Um, you know, as far as the language barrier, that's definitely something that Utah Community Action is, is, is working through as they're creating these one on one appointments. Um, but as far as, you know, providing additional information, uh, the hard part is, is in order for these to get submitted, that information or, or to get approved, that information has to be provided somehow, or there has to be a reasonable reason why that information can't be provided. Um, there's not a ton of ways around that. I wish I wish that there was, um, but unfortunately, you know, the 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 additional information that's required uh, is is something that you know you just gotta we just have to figure out a way to get to. And Sahil has arrived, and I'm so sorry about the technical <laughs> difficulties that are totally my fault. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it can only be for five minutes. Lord, Lord, yeah, Bobby, no worries. I'll try to stay as long as I can. Um, um, sorry, yeah. Mike. I I want to make sure Sahil answers the two questions yeah. that we. Yeah. Okay. But, so, but let me let me answer the last one for, before we forget it. Oh, okay. Andy had a good um, comment. Part of the reason why we've contracted with you because of your knowledge and ability to work with the various communities. One of the things we'd like you to do is be an advocate for that applicant. If we have language barriers that we would hope that uh, you're providing that assistance um, uh, to make sure there's a connection between the applicant and the process or, or the, even if the uh, uh, Sahil's case managers are contacting your client and if there is any communication barriers that we got to create a system where maybe uh, community action is contacting you to help with the communication. We can't we can't drop the ball as as was mentioned. There was one week to get this completed, and uh, so anyway, uh, so Hill could talk about the relationship uh, about the uh, community action and uh, the client and so we were talking about uh, processes and where there's language barriers or questions and trying to obtain additional information where the client may have a language barrier. we have a language barrier not the client <laughs> the system has a language barrier and uh, or them understanding the needs uh, of the documentation so we got to make sure that's addressed and maybe maybe uh, as you reply to the questions that have come up here thus far, um, that's one that we could address as well. So, unfortunately, Sahil only has like three more minutes. We had a scheduling conflict with this, but there will be a follow up question and answer session that will happen with Sahil. Um, and so there, I promise there will be time to ask him questions, but Sahil, would you mind? Um, there's two quick questions. If you could get to both of them, that would be great. But the first question hopefully is a short one. 
is what if someone borrowed money from a bank to pay their rent? Are, are these, can someone pay their bank loan back with these funds? No, it has to be something that's out. You have to have a, you have to have like an out, active outstanding debt. So it's unfortunate. I know we sometimes get people that have taken payday loans or what have you to pay for their rent. Um, it has to be, we have to have a ledger that shows that this is the delinquent amount. Okay, thank you. I, 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 not the answer everyone wanted, but then the next one, and this is a convoluted one, and I, that's why I wanted it to be your answer. Yeah, for Can sure. you explain if someone has a month to month lease, how yep. does that then, how does that process differ for, from someone who has a term lease? Uh, the process is slightly different. Um, if there is a term lease, the, uh, the positive impact we have is we can pay three months forward. Um, if it is a month to month lease, then we can only pay for that month and then they have to reapply through the portal. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to negotiate and encourage landlords to extend leases um, so they can get that rent up front. And um, as you guys are working with clients, um, work with their landlords and just say, like, I mean, that's the carrot, right? Is like, if you can extend it, fine, don't extend it for a year, extend it for six months, half of which you know will be paid up front. Um, I mean, it does a couple of things, right? Clears up the log jam because they're three months ahead. And then two, they don't have to reapply again. So that's that's what my case managers and I are where we're really trying to encourage landlords. And for the most part, once landlords find out that they can get three months of additional rent in the future, they are pretty happy to extend that lease. Other questions? Lauren, I'll stay on for five extra. I just told my team to get started without me. You're the best. So Hill, this is Andy. Quick question. Would it be possible for where in the application form that we indicate, you know? Client speaks a specific language, you know, Tangrinia, and that you guys contact us and we contact the client and we connect the interpreter. Just because I, you know, for, even for AAU to get interpreters for certain languages is very difficult. And especially if someone's calling from your program at, you know, and trying to get an interpreter. So the, we don't have any control of what can and can't go to the application. The application is what it is. Um, but if you have an applicant, if you have, if you're working with an applicant that does have a language issue, I mean, we will, you can work with us and call in behind uh, on their behalf and work with them and we can do a, uh, a group call for the appointment. Um, we also utilize the language line. Um, Andy, uh, you know, this, the language line doesn't have every language underneath the sun. So there are those circumstances where there are issues. If you have specific cases like that, please email me and we'll see what we can do to accommodate. Um, but before that's done, uh, the most important thing is to make sure the application that is turned in is complete. Yes, yes. for sure. Thank you. Yep. Suavez, do you have any questions? Okay, I don't think. Any other questions in general um, about the the flow? As Lauren said, we're going to meet, I know, in a week or so. But do you guys have any questions about the flow and the application process? No, I was no. going to ask you the same question. They just ask you about it because okay. some really uh, client, they may be really uh, even know they may not even know how to answer the phone or how to respond. You know, to the phone to say yes is me when it is the follow up. You know, a uh, question. You know about the application, and it will be really great idea to to put our name there. So if they are looking for them and they're setting up an appointment, they can involve us. So we can continue, you know, to help them to answer yeah. questions. Yeah, so Suavez, to your exact point, if you guys want to put your own phone numbers in instead of the client's phone numbers, that doesn't matter for us. Uh, the way, so let me just describe the way the process happens, right? So clients complete the application. I have an intake team that reviews the application for completeness. Um, if, it, if the application is found to be complete, we will call and we will schedule an appointment to meet with a case manager. Um, if the, if the um, application is incomplete, we will send an email and we'll let them know that you are meeting, you are missing X, Y, and Z documents. Um, we're trying to be as uh, accommodating as possible. I have honestly eliminated most of the things. Even if they don't have a complete lease, we're still accepting appointments. We'll just get that from the landlord. Um, so we're trying to accommodate as much as possible, but there are certain things that need to be in the application. And like Mike said, Earlier, just want to second what he's saying. You guys are, you know, community organizers. So if you guys want to put your phone numbers there and have us reach out to you instead of the client, I, we have no issues with that. Oh, thank you. Any other quick questions for me? 
Yeah, I have another question, Sahir. Uh, the other question is, uh, obviously this program is also for the outreach and uh, you know, we have a community meeting, we meet them, we educate them about this uh, particular, you know, opportunity, this grant. So how can we also report that we are doing outreach? And because I know uh, sometimes is uh, can be really uh, because we are like, for example, refugee community, we are too many community leader, and we we want to help each other to reach out to as many people as possible. So we make sure no one is left behind. Are we going to be reporting about the number of people we are reaching out and? Uh, I don't know what is the process of reporting. So we'll cover that'll be a separate report uh, to the county, and we'll cover that as soon as Sahil has to has to hop off. So we'll we'll cover that next. Okay, thank you. Okay, one last round. Any other questions that you guys have with the process at all? And what we do? Just one question, Sahil. Uh, is there any eligibility criteria statement or even a list? Uh, we can check before we even start the application process. So that way, we can save time if they're not going to be eligible. Or something like that, so we can avoid collecting documentation or even having a meeting with uh, somebody who we needs to meet with. I'm sorry, I, I I didn't understand the first part of the question. So you know, is there any kind of quick uh, eligibility criteria we can check check uh, before we even start the application? Yeah, I mean it's the client. Yeah, so that's it's it's honestly a pretty straightforward thing, right? Is like, have they been adversely impacted by COVID, or have you been impacted by COVID? And if it's a yes, the application has four, four, four or five different check boxes. Um, so it's it's just making sure that there is a connection to the they were impacted by COVID. Does that make sense? That's that's honestly the biggest requirement. Eligibility requirement is have you been impacted by COVID? Okay. Directly yeah, indirectly. I think that was that was the first page of the application, right? If we can take those three or four questions, that should answer the whole whole thing. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, like, as far as like the other, so that's the eligibility criteria, right? Is do you have you been directly or indirectly impacted by COVID? So that's eligibility. But then there are supporting document or required documents you need. You need to have a lease. You need to have your landlord. Com uh, you need to have a sorry your uh, contact for your landlord. You need to have if you have income thirty day thirty days of pay stubs, so on and so forth. It's outlined in the um, it's outlined in the application. Um, I think that Lauren, did you send the or did you share that YouTube clip? Or that uh, on our site, we have a YouTube uh, walkthrough of how the application works. Has that been shared yet? I haven't, but we just walked through the, the whole application um, oh, okay. before you hopped on. Perfect. So you guys know exactly what, what we need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Sahil. You are the um, State Portal Rental Assistance Whisperer. Uh, and that no is Sahil. He just shared his email address in the chat. Um, and like I said, we'll set up another uh, another session like this where we can just kind of talk through the the questions and things that you're you're coming up with uh, as you kind of start the application assistance process. So, Sahil, thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it, and uh, have the rest of a good day. Thanks, Lauren. Bye. Good Saeed. Saeed, nice to see you again. Thank you. Always good seeing you, Suavez. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Um. So Sahil is my new favorite person and can and always can answer the question. So if you ask me a question and I don't have the answer, I guarantee you he's the guy that I'm that I'm going to if I'm not going to Mike or uh, Mike or Karen uh, from from the county. So in the last kind of 20 minutes that we have uh, in our meeting today, I want to talk about uh, the reporting process to Salt Lake County. So we've walked through the portal. We've talked about how the application uh, works so that you guys can begin to assist your communities and clients in the application process. Um, and now we're going to talk about reporting for Salt Lake County, but I'm actually going to stop the recording now. Um, because I'm happy to answer any follow up questions on this outside.